we have some audio going. Audio working, testing one, two, three. I do this every day with my podcast. All right. Microphone is working. I hope you guys stick around. We're going to have a good session coming up. I want to call our three panelists up to the stage. Come on, guys. Come on. Hey, you guys leave. Why are you guys leaving? Hey, hey, hey this is the fun. best panel of the day. Come on. But that's okay. No, you guys got something else to do. I see. That's all right. It's I whatever. guarantee you, if you, shame you, if you sat shame here you. and listened to us talk about Web3, you would understand that we have revenue generating systems for every one of your athletes, every one of your businesses, every one of your ecosystems and verticals. So no, you no, might no, want to listen. Don't, they don't like more revenue, right? Nobody? Nope. Hate it. No. All right. Whoever sticks around is in for a good 20 minutes. So I want to introduce my panelists, but I really want to give my panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves. So we've got Ricky, we've got Jay Chains, we've got Stash. You guys want to introduce yourselves? Yeah, so I am the CEO of Final Frontier, a professional gaming organization with a goal to unite people and create change through gaming. We, uh, we just hit two years old. We're now in 34 countries and with just under 6,000 gamers. And we're also now into the tech, media, and entertainment with our own two magazines to uh, educate and bring more awareness to not just Web2 gaming, but Web3 gaming and the space. That's nice. Thank you, Rick. Uh, my name is Justin. I go by J Chains in the crypto space. Uh, I host a daily uh, podcast. It's on Twitter. We also live stream it to YouTube, LinkedIn, and uh, several other platforms. It's called Web3 Breakfast. We are a, it's a community show by the community, for the community. You know, we, we really give everybody a chance to have a voice and have a platform uh, because we are all about fostering collaboration. That's my main focus right now. That's my show. I've been creating content alongside Stash since 2018 in the crypto space. But most importantly, uh, one thing that we're trying to accomplish as a, uh, a chain labs. We, I live in Atlanta. My, my show host is going to come down there pretty soon. And we want to build a, uh, a financial literacy blockchain education center, but also a community development center, right? So there's opportunities. Again, we talk about verticals. We talk about revenue streams, all that stuff. Guys, this is a brand new ecosystem and economy. And the more people that we can bring in in a positive way, because I'm sure you all know that, you know, in the crypto space, you think, Ugh, how's that going for you? Or NFTs, which you got a monkey picture? Like, yeah, there's a lot of really cool building and stuff happening in the Web3 space. We'd love for anybody to come and uh, check out the show. It's Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. Eastern. You can find it on X, uh, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Thank you. He's done. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, my name is Crypto Stash. I just go by Stash most of the time these days. Uh, I am a streamer, gamer, entrepreneur. I've been in the gaming space for quite some time and also the cryptocurrency space since 2013. Uh, I've pretty much seen it all and I've kind of combined both of those passions together, right? And uh, it's been, it's been a, f a fun journey. But really what we do is I try and really try and connect with the community and showcase what the power of blockchain and NFTs can be uh, in gaming specifically, but across a lot of other entertainment verticals which are, you know, are, are pretty important. When you talk about uh, entertainment in general, you know, gaming is one of the largest ones, and sports plays a big part of that as well in gaming. Uh, I, but I have a question before we get started here. How many of you guys consider esports an actual sport? Raise your hand. Okay. It's okay. okay. Don't, don't be afraid if you don't. That's cool. All right. All right. It's not bad. Not bad. All right. I'll take it. Thanks. My first question was going to be, why do they call you Stash? Uh, you know, many moons ago when I was born, I, I, it, it was the weirdest thing. And the dot, I popped out and I, it was already on my face. Was and it, so they're like, hey, this, we're, we'll, just, we'll just decree it now. Do was it any baseball fans already? in the room? It, this is not even wax. I literally wake up like this every day. It's just kind of a weird phenomenon. And I just ran with it. And so, uh, you know, it kind of has a mind of its own these days. I'm not going to lie. Sometimes Stash. I'm on stream and, and uh, it gets me to do some things that maybe you guys Stash. would think a little unsavory, okay. but... This is, a, this is a sports conference. Do we have any sports fans here? Any baseball fans in the room? Anyone remember yes. Raleigh Fingers? So. Raleigh Fingers is on the stage with us this evening. That's so, true. my first I'm question. I'm more talented. My first question to our esteemed panelists What is the future of interactive entertainment? So, <clears throat> imagine an environment for gaming that challenges 
everything we thought we knew about economics, about the euphoric experience of gaming, about corporate promotion, about revenue earning. And we actually have a sample video for you all right now to be able to see what I'm talking about. The station reported a distress signal last night. They think it came from your dad's ship. The signal? It came from past the outer ring. How is that even possible? His ship has been reported missing for 20 years now. Pretty sure he's not coming back. We go there. We might not come back. What is this place? This is going to change everything! They found out we have the map! They're gonna kill us for it! If that's the case, there's only one thing we can do. History has begun right here. Global Sports Business Forum, thanks to Jay Tucker. Big hand for Jay Tucker, by the way. Round of applause, thank you. By the way, a little trivia tonight. Jay Tucker was my TA back when I was a student at Anderson. Little history. Jay That's, Chains, Future yeah. of Interactive Entertainment. I'm sure if you haven't watched the movie, maybe you read the book, right? Like me, I read the, or I listened to the audiobook. I thought that was the best way to understand. And I guess it was very captured. It was very captivating. Ready player one. You guys, right? Let's get to the oasis. That is the future of where we're going. 10 years from now maybe? Ooh, that's a little soon. 15 years that might from be now? a little soon. <laughs> right. So the whole idea is that's where we're going. We're going digital, right? Everything's going digital. Money's going digital. Everything is going digital. You're the way that you communicate with people is going digital. We all know that. We're already living in the metaverse. Raul Paul, I don't know if you guys know who Raul Paul is. I think it was about a year and a half ago in an interview. He was saying, listen, you're already living in the metaverse, right? When you FaceTime somebody, when you Zoom call somebody, when you just talk to them on the phone, you're not actually talking in real life. That's a digital re-representation of their voice and their likeness, right? If it's a Zoom call. Okay, so you're already in the metaverse. That's the future. Now, once we get into a fully immersive society ecosystem, that's when you're gonna see stuff like the Oasis. That's gonna blow everyone's mind. But again, 15 years, 10, 15, to anywhere from 10 to 20 years until you see like what you saw in that movie, the Oasis, until you can like plug in and forget about life. No, I mean, the development's already here when you look at the fact that uh, if we wanted to share messages with each other just you know, 30 years ago, well, it was a note on a piece of paper that you slid somebody in class or, you know. Um, you got to fold it fancy first. <laughs> or Will you go to prom with me? Right. Yes, no. Or the gaming was, you know, I mean, the first multiplayer was just you sitting next to someone else with a cord plugged into the game system. Uh, now you can play against 50 other people anywhere around the world. The experience has also changed so that there, it can be wireless. It can be VR. So we're watching this all evolve and some people aren't paying attention, but I mean, the future is not just coming, it's already here. You guys have made reference to the metaverse. What should everyone here understand about the metaverse? Where are we, where are we going? Um, so, you know, to answer that question, I, I'm gonna piggyback on what the question you answered, or you asked uh, you know, previously. Uh, I think really what the future comes down to accessibility, right? Uh, being able to provide more accessibility between, or, or foster that, that link and that relationship between 
uh, someone like a content creator or, or an athlete and their fans. And some of the technologies we're seeing emerging right now in Web3 and blockchain help to do that in a way that we have not had the ability to do in a verifiable way until now. Uh, you know, we've had ways to do it, but not in a way that you can say, yes, I know for sure that this person is a, is a fan and I can verify that fact. And so there's a lot of cool things that we're seeing. And then we talk about, well, how, why does that, how does it tie into a metaverse? Well, you, you need those things if you're going to have a full digital representation of yourself as a, a, a gaming avatar, right? Because if you're going in there and you're spending real time and real money and making real relationships, yet all of the, the, the items and data you can't, can't be trusted because it's all in one centralized server and can't be verified independently or transparently in any kind of way, then you start to have problems. And we already see those problems are arising in all of the systems that we use currently, right? It doesn't matter what, what industry you're in, you know that there's a problem out there. If you're in an industry and you're, and you're here and passionate about it, then you know at least one problem in your industry that could be solved by something, maybe you don't know what it is. And at this point, could it be blockchain? It could. It could be something else. But I, I think in general, there are a lot of applications there that help with that accessibility between an individual and their fans or, or an entity and their community. And that is the biggest driver of what will take us from where we're at right now with, with what people call a metaverse, which we don't truly really have in the sense of like what JChange is saying is a, a ready player one where literally everything is connected, but we're getting there. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's not something that I think most people really understand what, need, what technology needs to be laid, the foundation needs to be laid before we can get to that point. But we, but we will. But the fact of the matter is, is it, is it going to be VR? Is it going to be AR? Is it going to be something that you're going to spend your entire life in? I mean, probably not, to be perfectly honest. But a metaverse can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, we're, but we're just not there yet. But the technology is getting very close. And so, but, but when you talk about that, well, how, how does that translate into sports or into these other verticals? Uh, I think that you guys, it, there's some great examples we're already seeing. How many people have uh, you know, seen in, you know, or played any kind of sports games and be able to have or, or purchase their favorite player in that game and play as them? Well, that's, that's, that's going to come in a, whole, in, a, in a bigger way here in the future where you, where you have the ability to do that, but ownership over that too. But we're also actually, we're seeing this uh, in the sports world already, right? Like with the example, we're seeing more and more uh, professional teams, and there's an organization that's handling a lot of this right now where they're going to take their stadiums and they're going to make them virtual, right? So now as a fan, you can go in and have this amazing virtual experience that only maybe other holders or you know, community members, as we like to call them in Web3, are participating in, right? So now you've got these crazy fans fan experiences that are exclusive to only people that are participating in this. So now you can, you know, do meet and greets. And, and it's very easy for, you know, someone like Stash to sit in front of a camera and have a conversation with anybody sitting in, in a, a room wherever they have to be at their house. Technically, that's like the metaverse right now, right? So then now you could have a Q&A session with Stash that you either one, uh, you know, in some kind of uh, raffle system or because you're a season ticket holder, whatever it happens to be, there literally are so many applications for how you can reward your, your loyal fans, your, your, even your athletes, your student athletes, you know, with programs like the metaverse and how we start to incorporate the blockchain into NIL and all this stuff. I mean, this is, and it's really weird for me because uh, full circle, uh, I was in the collegiate athletic space uh, in, a, in a different capacity for many years before I got into Web3. So to see all these opportunities that y'all are looking at, like, I know your pain points, and I know blockchain can solve a lot of them. Let's have a conversation. I, I definitely think uh, purpose matters, right? But everyone has a purpose in that particular gaming metaverse or just standard metaverse. Uh, Yakuverse is a great example. Bloomverse is a great example. What you all just saw on the screen of Star Atlas, okay, imagine a, a, uh, a planet that is going to have a concert on it with Dead Mouse, the, the DJ, and if you own one of his NFTs, that is your virtual ticket to the concert. So you can get on your spaceship, fly on over to the concert, and the venue could be owned by any one of your businesses or corporations or organizations, and there's your revenue share in a virtual environment. Just as simple as putting on a VR set and you're there. 
the concert, the virtual concert thing is very important because this is something like I just talked to you about. You know, you at UCLA here, you literally could make a virtual environment for the Poly Pavilion, right? And now the top 10 metaverse concerts that they've had so far, and it's like Justin Bieber, uh, Marshmello, Ariana Grande, I mean, the list goes on and right. The top 10 of these concerts had 185 million views combined, right? So what if, you charged, if you charged a dollar for each one of these people to come in, that's $185 million. Do you see where this is going? Like exponential growth and revenue streams for the virtual world. And it's just something we're scratching the surface of. We, it's like we like to say we are building the plane as we're flying it. And that's like legitimate. Well, and, 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 and to my point, what is that? Accessibility, right? How many people can get to the Poly Pavilion and how many can't? But when you have those digital representations, you increase accessibility, right, to these products. So you can reach more fans in a more meaningful way. Right across all verticals, which you know, and then you can do things like verify, like yes, I know this person is a fan. Not just that they're following me on social media, not that maybe they just watch me, you know, on Sunday, but the fact that yes, I can verify through this thing that they hold, I know they're a fan, and then you can reward those fans in unique ways and do interesting things to give them more accessibility to either yourself or to your organization in ways that you couldn't really do uh, without possible fraud or other malicious things being thrown in there too, where, where that's a pretty big industry. I mean, it's a pretty big issue in a lot of different industries, for sure. And the reason why we say gaming is gonna be the conduit, right? That future, that, that bull run, so to speak, is because in the traditional side of things, there's 3.7 billion gamers in the world. Only 1.8 million total in the Web3 space right now, and only about 175,000 that are always active. Imagine what our world looks like when that 1.8 million becomes 100 million, 500 million. Corporations are using the gamers, the video games, as conduits for promos, for products. Imagine walking in a virtual environment, seeing this microphone, paying for it, and that microphone shows up at your door. That's what these metaverses are going to bring. So I want each of you to share a couple of high level and a couple of granular takeaways for everyone here around the business side of everything we're talking about. You're a creator, you're a brand. What should you understand today? What should you understand going forward? If you, it, well, what, I guess the, the big takeaway, you know, for anybody that, and I assume, you know, there's a lot of the athletic department here, right? And so the, at the end of the day, right, you know, NIL is a big thing for you. And uh, I was at uh, NFTLA, this is what, two years ago? And we, and actually Stash and I were talking to this guy, he, and he was a, uh, like a contracts lawyer, right? And he was talking about how, you know, when you, uh, as a professional athlete, or we all even know that musicians are in predatory contracts, right? So, but now what they can do is you can say, I'm going to draw a line in the sand. And so now like, you know, this version of me, that's, you know, that's the physical me. That's the one that's in this shitty contract. But this is my digital version. So now I can go out and get my own sponsorships. I can go ink my own deals. I can, you know, we like the, for what we're building in networks as content creators, like the buying power, right? So now if I've got Stash, me, Turbo, and Rick, and we're all trying to, you know, build content, like now we can go to a sponsor and say, hey, listen, we got his eyes, my, my eyes, his eyes, his eyes. So now instead of, you know, giving me a $5,000 sponsorship or whatever, it's a $50,000 sponsorship because of our collective buying power. That's what you guys have to understand is like, you can help your athletes, you can help your, you know, esports teams, you can help your gamers, like literally ease into this and let them know that there is a, an entire ecosystem waiting for them. Because what is it? The number one people want to be right now. What's the number one job, if you guys had to guess, that anybody, any kid wants to be right now? Streamer. Streamer. They don't want to be doctors. They don't want to be uh, firefighters. They don't want to be astronauts anymore. They want to be content creators and influencers. What do you say sure. to your kid that wants to be an NFL player? Get out on the field and practice. What do you say to your kid that wants to be an NBA player? Go shoot hoops. What if your kid says, I want to be a gamer? What are you going to say to him? It's never going to work. Get outside. I saw, I saw a hand up there. But like, what do you say to your kids when they want to be a professional gamer? Sit down on that couch and play those games. That seems so counterintuitive. There are kids making millions of dollars playing video games. It's a viable thing. I, I think uh, one of the biggest takeaways here is that educational piece. Learn what's coming. And when you properly learn, you have the ability to earn. We're going to see this in college. We're going to see it in high schools. We're already seeing it in middle schools. 
you're going to see it influence NIL. You're going to see it influence way of life at home, right? People's jobs are going to be to wake up, earn from a phone. There's some in here right now earning Unstar Atlas as they're taking part in the forum. And some of you had no idea. It's already happening. But that education piece is the biggest. How do we incorporate this into classes? How do we incorporate this into work plans? Training, right? Job training. This, this is realistic. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's technology, and that's something that's always hard to incorporate. Uh, when you talk high level, you know, what I would say is that, yeah, we, if you've not gotten a lot of exposure to cryptocurrency and Web3, maybe it's a you know, very surface level, you might not think that it can impact your business in a, in a positive way, but the problem is, is because there's a lot of hype that's been pushed around that. But really when it comes down to it is blockchain technology in its most simple form could increase your productivity and your efficiency by 20%. How many people would want 20% more profit or 20% more efficiency in their business? Where it could replace an existing system that you are already using, but just be a little bit more efficient, a little bit more transparent, a little faster, right? So we talk about high level, that's, that's what I would say is that, you know, if you, if you are not finding ways to incorporate blockchain and also AI here coming soon, or, you know, right now too, but uh, th those things will exponentially help you to be more productive, right? Now, I'm just on, gonna stash. I'm just yeah. gonna step in really quick, and this could be answered by you. This can be answered by anyone here. How? Well, I mean, it, it's gonna be different for every business, right? Uh, when it comes down to it, but you talk about the efficiency of the blockchain, being able to record these transactions or be able to to look at this data in a transparent manner that you know cannot be messed with, right? No one, no one can go in there and change the numbers or fudge the thing, you know, uh, t turn, uh, you know, a thousand into 10,000 for themselves. How many times do we see accounting errors or other areas with, with systems because they simply don't have that immutability. And if you guys don't understand, immutability just simply means that it cannot be changed, right? So that transparency and that immutability can be a boon to a lot of companies, right? When you see like, hey, you know, o only, the, only the head, uh, you know, CFO has this data. Well, you know, it turns out he's been screwing everybody over. We didn't know. And we didn't really have any good way to know because he had full control of this. There's no transparency there, right? So there's a lot of ways you can apply blockchain technology to your particular business. Uh, it's just being open to finding where it can fit in and how it can make what you're doing more efficient in the system you're de building. They can be closed e systems, too. It doesn't necessarily have to be a e public system, but transparent. You want to e dive in? Esports is going to be a big one, right? Because uh, a lot of you may not know, sometimes it takes quite a while to get those earnings from esports tournaments. And, and, and it, that's a great point. And so you talk about earnings in general. Uh, for, for athletes, for esports players, for, for musicians. Uh, I mean, me being a musician as well, I, I understand this. And, you know, trying to get those, those residual checks or those sponsorship checks, sometimes that shit takes forever. Forever. But imagine a blockchain based system where as soon as the action that you have completed to, you know, meet your contract is done, it automatically executes, this, this code automatically ex executes and sends you that money directly to your account in seconds, not weeks, not, not days, not months, and it's there, ready to go. Is that not so, more efficient than having to cut a freaking paper check yeah. and then send it out by mail? Stash, I just want to be mindful of the clock. We have, we have about seven minutes left. I want to save some time for audience questions, but I want to ask one more question to the three of you, which is something that I think is interesting, not only to MBA stu students, but to students studying across UCLA, which is analytics hot in just about every business and a big part of what each of you are involved in, each of you are engaged in. Can you share what anyone here should understand about data analytics and how it relates to the world of interactive entertainment? Yeah, so there's a multitude of ways that can happen. For one, the data is going to be public ledger, but also the data can be sharded this is very helpful for organizations that have to move a lot of data or store a lot of data because the blockchain has the ability to do that 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 times faster. And so when it comes to pay systems, when it comes to uh, data storage, video storage even, the blockchain is going to 
have some sort of way to not just make it public ledger, but also to make it very ease of access to store that information. <laughs> I love analytics, and I'm not even joking. You know, as a podcaster, as a YouTuber, as someone who's constantly like putting stuff out there, I always like, and this is, I mean, we'll get, we'll, we'll bring it full circle here, but like, I'm always constantly checking how can I be better, right? And there, that doesn't change like in blockchain, like how can things be better? Like how can you, like, I don't know. I love analytics, we'll just leave it at that. So, uh, you know, what it comes down to is uh, analytics, do you, do you think every piece of data they get is 100% correct? Um, when you talk about, hey, if I'm analyzing this thing, how many clicks did it get? How many views did it get? How many impressions did it get? You know how easy that stuff is to fake or bot? And then that's now. And now with the rise of AI, does it get even easier? Yes, it does. What's the solution there? How, how do we get true analytics? How do we truly understand what is actually happening and not what's being manipulated? Once again, blockchain technology can help with that, right? When you talk about the transparency and, and this information being pushed through uh, you know, a blockchain and, and a, a public ledger in some case, or sometimes maybe a, a private ledger, you can understand that this was a valid click. This was a valid interaction with whatever we're doing versus, I, I don't know, it could have been boss, it could have been the same guy coming on five different phones and clicking yes a million times, right? But blockchain technology empowers you and gives you the tools to be able to fight that. Questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Vishaka. I'm, in, I'm a student at UCLA Law. So I had like two questions with regards to when you spoke about the music concerts in Metaverse. The first being, um, the first being, what do you think is the appeal in concerts like that, as opposed to say just viewers viewing, um, say, a live reel of the artist's performance? Is it just an, uh, is it just like an immersive, a more immersive experience? Or do you think there's really a difference as opposed to, you know, just like seeing an artist's Instagram and them performing live on that? Oh yeah, no, it's, it's, it's totally, it's, so it's more immersive, right? So if you go into one of those virtual concerts, you're actually like on the dance floor with all of your friends. And some of these metaverses actually have spatial audio. So everybody that's there, you can just talk and everybody can hear the same thing. Now maybe, you know, it geolocates. So if you're in that corner of the room, all the only people there can hear it. And over there, like whatever. So like, yes, it is way more immersive and you can actually be there having a conversation with somebody on the dance floor while the band's up on stage. Yeah, okay. way more fun. And it provides those who don't have the resources or the money to make that trip to get there, right? Uh, let's say uh, concerts in Florida. I live in Georgia or Texas. It may be easier. But when I live in the UK, when I live in India, when I live in, you know, uh, you know Africa or somewhere like that, well, now the amount of resources and funds needed just amplify greatly. We like to say it's borderless, right? It's borderless. You can be anywhere, and you can be anything anywhere at any time, and everybody gets the same opportunity to, uh, to participate in the ecosystem. We have, we have time for uh, sorry, one. I had just like a second. We have, question. We have two minutes left. We, we, can we take it offline? Um, sure. Our panelists are going to stick around. Yes, in the back. I will definitely stand over there and answer as many questions as you have until every question is answered, because I love questions. Yeah, hello, how's it going? I'm on BC, or if I call me Time, uh, T-Y-M-E-D, teaching young minds every day. I was going to question about uh, diversity and actually access of, of more, more different communities, like especially the minority communities and women who aren't really necessarily involved in a lot of this space. How do you see uh, being able to reach out to those communities and be able to have that, that, that community be more involved in, in, the, in the whole process? Ladies. Ladies, if you're listening, the camera, if you're listening, we need more women in Web3. We need you here. There is a I, uh, space for you to come get in where you fit in. We literally need more women, more, yes. we just need more diversity, right? It can't yeah. be all white guys doing this stuff. We need everyone. So please, 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 I, uh, hit us up in the DMs. Shoot me an email. Come and we'll teach you how to do it. Just get into Web3, please. We, we, we have... We, Final Frontier is actually working on a solution to that, right? Because every problem does have a solution. Uh, and that is meta power. And that's where we are putting out there the voices of women around the world, their stories, visions, goals, dreams, passions, their artwork, their projects, their businesses, and being able to tell their stories. 
And so uh, it's not just asking women to empower other women. It's a group of the four horsemen, men, who said, hey, you know what, fellas? Let's give the women their floor in an environment that is heavily riddled with men, right? Especially in the gaming environment where men outweigh women 25 to 1. Ricky, J-Chains, Stash, a great audience. Thank you. Big round of applause.